Today, we're talking the Nazi occult. Sometimes Adolf Hitler seems like such an outsized character that we believe he willed the Second World War and the Holocaust into being all by himself. Well, he was a charismatic guy, and it's difficult to imagine Germany's fascists without him. I can't. Right? I don't want to. He was just the tip of a great big cultural spear, an important part of which included the occult. Ooh. Right? What? I'm, I'm about to explain. That's aggressive there. We're, what? <laughs> yes, it included the occult, Savannah. Well, imagine that. Imagine it. Imagine a great big cultural spear. We're going to cover three major aspects of Nazism that have their origins in the occult. The swastika, number one. Mm. Heinrich Himmler's... Sorry, what was that again? Wait, what? The swastika, yeah. number oh, one. Okay. Heinrich Himmler's Magus, Magus, meaning magic, magic man, magic man, his own personal magic Sounds man. Sounds a little close to a MAGA, if I'm being honest. Oh no, <laughs> we know that you associate everything to the conservatives, there, Savannah. <laughs> oh God, what am I doing to myself? <laughs> and uh, yeah, hey, Republican listener, Savannah's back. God. And the magazine. <laughs> Ostara, number three. So when, by the time we get to the Ostara, you're, you're, on, you're in the home stretch of, of this, of, of Nazism. Mm. Nazi magic. We take these themes and a good bit of research from today's, for today's episode from Nicholas Goodrick Clark's excellent book, The Occult Roots of Nazism, which we recommend to our listeners and we'll have linked on our resources page at occultconfessions.com. There's lots to know, and his book is a great way into this. Uh, we'll also be drawing on several other sources here as we begin to discuss the Nazi occult. Let's get started on today's confession. I am Dr. Rob C. Thompson, professor of magic men. Hmm. I believe new. it. Okay. Where'd you get that title? I, I don't believe it. It's, it's, on, my, it's, on, his it's on my business card. It's yeah. what I do professionally. But here in the Alchemical Actors, I am the uh, supreme hierophant. Mm. Uh, to my right, I have uh, James Kaplangis. Hello. Captain I'm of the table? Captain of the table. Oh, you were just going to say that. I was. But Let's try okay. that again. Okay. To my right, I have James Kaplangis. Captain of the table. Hello. I, hello. <laughs> Uh, and now Brianna Literal is uh, next to James here, but we have to do a little bit of business with Brianna before we get going, because Brianna has, has requested a name change. This is highly unorthodox. Mm, highly unorthodox. Uh, Captain, do you think we can allow this? Uh, I'll have to consult the book. Okay. There's yeah, book. I'll allow it. Okay, great. That yes. was a quick consultation. The book is, it, James <laughs> has memorized the book, I have. but he has to consult it occasionally. Does he just look at it? It's like a filing, and it's in ah, his, okay. his mind. It's in the dark pool. <laughs> so you were originally some sort of knob-based human. Mm. Now, uh, you've asked to be changed to the metal detector. Mm. Seems like that's not a properly occulty title, so I'm willing for that to be your nickname. All right. But we need a, a properly occult-sounding robes and daggers kind of title. And I've, decided, I've thought on this, and I think the metallurgic prophet... Metallurgic prophet. Ah. <laughs> okay, so it gets the metal yep. sound of approval. Yep. Uh, and That's it. Next, it's my name now. next to Brianna, so oh, that'll be he will be the me the prophet of the metallurgy, metallurgic prophet, also known as the metal detector. So many names for you. I'm here for it. I have to keep an eye on you. And Savannah <laughs> Ferret is back at the mic. Hello. Savannah is in need of a new title. And I think we can go ahead and get that done before we do the, the pledge. I'm finally getting a title. We don't want you to pledge without a title today, title? Savannah. Now, uh, it, it, as you've just demonstrated, no. all things <laughs> related to the Republican Party. Ooh. Oh, God. What have I done? You dug yourself a hole. Right. Uh, oh, God. And we know that your favorite political campaign <laughs> of the 20th century was the Reagan 84 campaign. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was a classic. That one knowledge. curse and saved every other president. You know, <laughs> that's a cool dude. So, no, okay, but seriously, I saw this image online, like, or this video online afterwards where, like, after he had that assassination attempt against him, yeah. he was saying a speech and a balloon popped at, while he was in the middle of giving his speech, so he stopped and he went, missed me, and then continued on with his speech. <laughs> oh, my god! And I was kind of sitting there like, man, Reagan is the man. That's <laughs> pretty funny. That's pretty, pretty cool. Except to uh, Nicaragua. 
Sorry. All right. What? So. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, I see. I see. The uh, con- around Contra. Yes. This Nicaragua, wasn't it? The Grenada. Yes. Grenada. What? Grena- How did Grenada get into this? Was Grenada involved? No. We invite our listeners to correct our 1980s knowledge of politics. Please do. I know nothing about them, so. <laughs> Which is why you're going to be the sister of the 84th degree, in honor of your man, Ronald Reagan. That's nice. Yeah. Could That's be not worse. as bad as I thought it was going to have Reagan in it. Yeah. Cool. yeah. But it's just 84th degree. I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So more elegant. Yeah. Let's get down to the pledge. Ready? We, we, the members of the secret order of alchemical, alchemical actors, do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. All right, uh, it's time for the uh, business meeting. Let's have Shannon Landers over to the mic for our business meeting. She's our Instaquisitor in charge of our various social medias. Shannon? Hello. Yeah, Shannon is sighing Everyone. because she has got uh, words of apology for one of our listeners I here do. in our first ever occult confessions scandal. Our first scandal. Yeah. I, I'm almost proud of that, but I'm really not. Okay, so it's what, still what scandal, happened? It's a scandal, but it's the it first one. It is a scandal. One. First one, so that's First scandal. Kinda... So that's you did that. That's nice. Mm. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Congratulations. At least, at least I did Ooh. something. Right. Right? Yeah, it's, it's a... Wow, okay. <laughs> well... I just want to apologize because um, when we were talking about one of our listeners, Hayden, before... Hayden, yeah. Art equals science equals magic, right? Yeah. yeah. He uh, messaged us and had that really awesome point about... Um, I'm sorry. Did we, you say he? He. See, yeah. That, <laughs> it brings me to this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Hayden listened to an episode. Yes. And he messaged me. Hi, he Hayden. Like, hey, Hayden. Hello. 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 And he's like, hey, I like, thank you so much for mentioning me in the podcast, but I am not a woman. <laughs> <laughs> but love you guys. <laughs> How very gracious of Hayden. I you know, I always. To so, gently point that out to you. I feel so embarrassed. No, it's no. A, it sounds like okay. Hayden was been honest. a real cool been. guy. No, he was about a real nice guy so, about oh, it. Yeah. He was just like. <laughs> He's like, it must be from all the feminine energy I put out in the there world. There you go. He's, I a, am he's a he's a man a comfortable with his masculinity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who am I? Twenty eighteen. Still assuming people's genders. <laughs> right. I don't from know. now on, we should not assume genders. <laughs> no. See, let me, to explain myself a little bit, just you know, when you use Messenger, you click on a photo. The photo is so tiny. And the only other Hayden I know is like a female coworker of mine. So it's I one of those see names. the face. You've been programmed. Yeah, to believe mm. that a Hayden yes, is a, a lady. Yes, that's all I have ever known. That's all <laughs> I've ever right. known. Right, it's your upbringing. So I just saw a tiny, tiny little face of glasses and a name Hayden, and I'm like, ah, it's probably a lady. I don't know. Because <laughs> women don't see well, or I don't. That's, that's what I've heard. <laughs> she went out. <"Hey."> <laughs> My wife really? needs glasses. I don't. So you know, I put in a lot of thought. And care when like people message us, I'm like, I want to take the time to respond to them and make sure they know that we care. I just overlooked the minor things like their gender and like. Well, that, that was the a, a, a good apology. Yes, nice job. You know, like, women visitor. are pretty great. It might. Be All right, that you're, don't dig yourself compliment. any deeper here. Let's let's get out of the hole okay. while we're okay. Very good. Uh-oh. Nice job. Okay. No, don't. Let's not. All right. Uh, we have some words of thanks. Uh, William uh, is actually professor of music here at the college. Has joined our joyful family of patrons. Oh, oh yay! Yeah. Thanks, Willie thanks, William. T. Good old Willie T. Uh, we heard from Nicholas on Facebook, uh, and Ian I think also made a comment on Facebook. Some of our regular listeners just letting us know they're enjoying. They enjoyed the Crowley episodes. Woo. And I got a message from uh, John on uh, our, through our website occultconfessions.com, and he'd like us. Uh, I'm assuming John is a he. That's not. I mean, it's not safe. Never be safe. I don't think he or she, assume. he or she, they, they could them. be last name. Wants to, wants us to explore uh, more occult books. So uh, we'll we'll get we'll get around to that. Had a couple of suggestions for us. We're definitely going to be talking about the secret doctrine during our Blavatsky series, though, mm. at the beginning of next year. So thank you, John, for your message. That's my favorite type of doctrine, the secret kind. Cool. It's the only kind well, we'll I make know. sure you're sitting in on that episode. Nice. All right, get out of here now. Okay. The business I'll meeting is over. Take Business adjourned. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a gavel. Uh, there's a gong sound. Okay, perfect. That we'll hear. Uh. Business is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> James made a little arm motion for us. Okay, let's get started. Speaking of Helena Blavatsky, it's time for the swastika. Did you say right. the swastika? The swastika. 
There are two major sources for the Third Reich's now infamous swastika. The first is Helena Blavatsky's Theosophical Society. Blavatsky, the world-traveling Russian mystic, had founded the society in America along with Henry Steele Alcott. It was a European-inspired occult response to America's passion for spiritualism. We talked about this society uh, and its founding in our first series on the podcast. Uh, there's an episode specifically devoted to Blavatsky, and we recommend that to new listeners so that I don't have to do that all over again. <laughs> uh, also, we're going to go back to Blavatsky because she had such a complex and fascinating career in our next series and, and talk about whether or not, I don't know, she secretly is in control of the UN, stuff like that. For example. Totally For example. Uh, but uh, today, uh, we're just going to figure out what she's doing in Germany and how she's managing to bring along a swastika with her. First, how she got to Germany. So... Alcott and Blavatsky were briefly famous in America for attacking spiritualist mediums by claiming that the supposedly human spirits they were talking to in their seances were actually demonic fairies and nature spirits. We've done this. Yeah, sound familiar, right? Her, Blavatsky and Olcott's second claim to fame came out of the funeral of the Baron de Palme. Does this sound familiar? The first man oh, to be cremated? Oh, yeah. I was just thinking that. Yeah, there you go. I remembered. Cremation was an Eastern practice that was frowned upon by the mostly Protestant Christian United States, and the event made all the newspapers. So this is what made her famous in America, and she heads over to India. Uh, she was getting her ideas about evil pixies and burning corpses from a crew of enlightened Mahat- Mahatmas. Hmm. Enlightened Mahatmas, somewhere in the Himalayas. Those are mountains. I, but yeah, I, I was. I, <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know. I was watching a show the other day uh, where there was a, a guy from India on the show, and he pronounced it the Himalayas. Really? Have you heard? Anybody heard that? I've never Himalayas. heard that be used. That anyway, <laughs> I feel they're closer though. I feel like they. I don't know, man. Much closer to the Himalayas than we are. <laughs> Anyway, uh, communicating. So anyway, so so she's communicating with these Mahatmas telepathically, um, or they're materializing letters for her to share with her buddy Henry Alcott and the other members of her secret society. Uh, Blavatsky's. What? Where is she? If they're communicating, like she's in America, she's oh. in Paris, she's all over the place. Okay, but they're still talking to her all that. Yeah, time. with magic letters, hmm. or in her telepathic brain. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, Blavatsky's and Olcott's American fame was fleeting, particularly as spiritualism's popularity was on the decline, and so nobody cared much about the people arguing with the spiritualists. So they packed up and headed for India. Why India? In part, because those Mahatmas and Blavatsky herself had been trained in Tibet, home of a very distinct brand of Buddhism. Follow me. So Tibet's in China, but follow me. Buddhism was originally a sect of Hinduism, which started as the Vedic religion in, you guessed it, India. Very nice. Much of Blavatsky's story in India will save for the future. But the most important event for the Nazis was when the Society for Psychical Research arrived to investigate her Mahatmas and determined that she was writing at least some of their supernaturally derived letters herself. So they were like, Mahatmas? Not so sure. Mm. So she was... Wait, so they found out she was fake? Yeah, they, they found out that she might be faking some things. It's complicated. We won't get into it, but it was caused enough of a scandal that she packed up and got out of there. Specifically, going to Germany, mm. where Europe's occult revival had recently caught on. Germany was a little late to the party. The occult revival started at the end of the 19th uh, century, uh, but by this point, uh, as we're getting into the 1890s, Germany's catching on to a thing that you know England had been up to, and, and she's like, okay, cool, I'll go there. They really like occult stuff. They'll love me. <laughs> uh, and, and they did it, yeah. the theosophy made a pretty easy transition to Germany it's possible to read some similarity between what Blavatsky had to say in her masterwork The Secret Doctrine and Nazi Ideology we'll just briefly touch on this again because I'm going to do a whole episode on Secret Doctrine Bla- okay. Blavatsky believed is that alright with you? yeah that's, that's fine cool Ca- as captain she be- <laughs> as captain you consent yeah I Night- do. nice Blavatsky believed that creation passed through seven rounds with a root race dominating each round. Follow me here now. The third root race were the Lemurians. Yeah, it's New Age stuff. Yeah, well, I know. You know the Lemurians. Yeah, you can picture some. Yeah, a podcast I listen to. Oh, really? About, about Lemurians? Yeah. yeah. Well, now you're on a podcast talking about it. Talking Meta. about a podcast. Yeah, talking about a podcast talking about Lemurians. Lemurians. So that's a, it's a New Age belief, the Lemurians. They're sort of a counterpart to the Atlanteans, who were the fourth root race, 
also having New Age fame. I've heard of the Atlanteans. Nice. I think. Got both sides. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, unless it's the different ones from the people who sank under the water. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's Atlantis. Yeah, excellent. All right. <laughs> uh, now, hey, let's get to the fifth one. This is really going to... The Aryans are the fifth one. Oh. Ooh, now we've arrived. Uh, <laughs> to the nothing. Ah, the Nazis. Nazis. The Aryans guided by Blavatsky's... I'm going to do that a lot. Guided by Blavatsky's Mahatmas. Uh, so here come the Aryans. The Mahatmas are guiding them. This is our fifth root race. It's important to note that historically the Aryans were the conquerors of the Indus Valley and the ancestors of modern Indians. True story. This really happened. Yes. Blavatsky's ideas had more to do with reviving what she believed to be the Indians' ancient spiritual tradition in India than anything like the racial purging the Nazis came to ascribe to. Oh. That's important. <laughs> I mean, she, so she herself was not a Nazi. No. Blavatsky, <laughs> like, not a Nazi. Murder them all. Blavatsky's swastika featured prominently on the seal of her Theosophical Society and was derived from her Hindu and Buddhist sources. As a Buddhist symbol, the swastika is over 7,000 years old, and you can find it on statues and monuments throughout India. The hooks of this swastika point one direction that suggests health and good fortune. From a Buddhist perspective, pointing the hooks in the opposite direction was a mark of bad fortune and death. But guess what? The Nazis pointed it in the bad fortune and death direction, the opposite of the Buddhist direction. Hmm. And this was uh, because of a man named Guido von Liszt. His name is Guido? Guido. Guido von Liszt. Guido von Liszt. He was the son of a merchant who styled himself as an aristocrat and the bearded old guru of Austro-German nationalism. What? Oh, say that one more time. He, he named himself Guru? Of no, 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 no. I'm, I'm no. calling him that. Oh. He was bearded. Time. True story. He was old at some point. He uh, was a guru. <laughs> and he argued for there being a sort of Austro-German, like the centrality of an Austro-German nationality. They need to re get make Germany great again. Make Austro-Germany huh. great again. <laughs> huh. At the ruins of the ancient Roman town of Carnuntum, along the Danube, which is a river, List buried wine bottles in the shape of the swastika to commemorate the 1500-year anniversary of the tribal German victory over the Romans. Get out of here, Romans. Yeah. Lists, I, we can all agree that the Romans should get the heck out of Germany. <laughs> Probably. Lists, I, do, I guess we can't. There was a lot of, there was. Uh, I was just going to let you keep going. Yeah, no, but the two, James and I are on board with <laughs> yeah, getting the Romans out of Germany. You guys, not so sure. I mean, Maybe the if they would have stayed, we wouldn't have had the Nazis. Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> I don't, I don't you know. know. Just had a bunch of Romans. <laughs> I think it might have just been. It explains worse all these Italian names. Yeah, it just would have been Ro and... Roman Nazis. I say it would have just been a worse Roman product if they had List. left. <laughs> so the, the Guido here uh, believed that German aristocrats had descended from an ancient German priesthood and that they were destined to rule again. Oh God! <laughs> this is probably why he added the aristocratic von to his name. So when you put von in your name in Germany, that's like if you're like uh, a lord. Isn't oh, okay. that the name of our cat, Louis von Elric? He's a German lord. Wow, yeah. guys, he looks. That's look at impressive. That. Yeah, how did he, he, such a short existence from the Michael Shelf to being on this podcast? He became a German lord in that time. <laughs> you too yes. can accomplish yes. great things. Like our <laughs> listening to the podcast. Yes, listen, post and visiting our Instagram page. You too can become a von. Uh, so. The problem was there were a bunch of German aristocratic gatekeepers uh, who were not a big fan of this, who had to sort of fight with them to keep his von. Because, you know, whenever there's aristocrats, they don't just want to let anybody in who adds three letters to their name. <laughs> oh, no, it's very exclusive. Mm. Right. Yes, yeah, it's not that easy to join the party. Uh, but he, he, I think he succeeded in keeping the von. So he lived in Austria, which was, and Austria was tensely divided between the Austro-Germans and the Eastern European Slav, Slavic people. Hmm. And they really ticked him off. List believed that the German aristocrats, who had fallen into decline uh, financially and, and culturally, would rise up and ultimately come to rule over the foreigners, meaning the Slavs, as their inferiors. Oh, those Slavs. Hmm. Poor I feel Slavs. attacked. Yeah, Brianna, you're Slav thick. I'm Russian. Yep. Well, List was trying to rise up against you. How does it make I have you feel? Some choice words in Russian to him. Hmm. 
I can't believe three. Can I say them? Will anybody that we does anybody know Russian that? Or you listens? think that we could? The mic only works one way. Oh. <laughs> but like they could still. Oh. Are you in there? Does anyone out there know Russian? <laughs> Go know? ahead. Go ahead. Say the choice words to list about how his anti-Slavic racism. Bolshnoi suka blood. Yeah, take that list. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Nazi. Savage. None of you know what that means. It's he great. wasn't a Nazi, but it was he created. He was important for to their swastika because he buried it in wine bottles. Anyway, list referenced the legend of Frederick Barbarossa, or Frederick the First, King of Germany and Italy. Hence all the Italian names. You see, there's a lot of connections. Yeah. Uh, and hence the Barbarossa. Not a very German name, but Frederick, very German. Barbarossa, not so much. They put them together. Frederick Barbarossa. It doesn't sound like a name. It he was the like Holy Roman Emperor. The best oh, of both worlds. I was about to say, it sounds like a dip that you dip chips in or something. Money dips are named after emperors. Are uh, artichoke and a dip. <laughs> artichoke? Onion dip? <laughs> Onion dip. Yes, all of those are named after emperors. Pizza dip. I've hummus. never heard of that. Is that really a thing? Yeah. Hummus is definitely named after some sort of Ottoman emperor, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not true. <laughs> we need a fact checker. Yeah, those of you who are taking notes for class or anything out there, don't, don't put that in. Now. Yeah, don't cite us. <laughs> we made up Tom all that said. stuff. Frederick Barbarossa was a guy, though. Those other, uh, Lord Onion. King, King Onion, <laughs> Holy Roman, King em- Holy Onion. Emperor of Rome, is not a guy though. Sultan Hummus. Sultan Hummus, also not a guy. Uh, so Barbarossa, which is Italian for Redbeard, that's true, huh. is sort of like the German King Arthur, albeit he had more of a historical basis than yeah. King Arthur. I don't want to piss off any of our British listeners, but King Arthur, you know, it's there's more, it's hazier. King Arthur's roots in Germ- in British history. He was bad at writing things <laughs> down. Right. Arthur never got around to that. Yeah, no. he was always busy being cheated on and stuff, so yeah. he couldn't write stuff down. Do you think he would have kept a diary about that stuff? Yeah, he probably wrote it on paper like an idiot. <laughs> As opposed to chiseling it in the or side of the castle. Exactly. internalized it. <laughs> yeah, he internalized all his pain. But Frederick I <laughs> did not, and that's why we can be pretty sure that he was an actual historical guy. He was a successful military commander and hero of the German people, and legend says that he never died. Wow. What do you mean? That's kind of... People like, say that. didn't... We'll hear the legend now. Oh. Grandfather List tells the story of the once and future king. Ah, yes, just the sort of tale two strapping young boys in Lieterhosen should hear. Let me fetch my notebook. I'm bored and my Lieterhosen itches. Tell us now, old man! The great Emperor Frederick Barbarossa in all his greatness could not die. No, he retreated into Kiefhauser Mountains, placing himself in a suspended state of sleep. For a thousand years he has sat at his table, Surrounded by his knights, and his beard has grown so long that it has grown through the table. But, Grandfather List, how can a beard grow through wood? It's much too soft. It makes no sense! I hate the story! At his table sat all his knights, waiting for the day when the ravens would stop flying. Every now and again he set out a boy, not unlike yourselves to check if the ravens continued to fly around the mountain. But I thought he was asleep. He was half asleep. But doesn't that mean he was half awake? Which one was he? Make up your mind! On the day when the boy returns the report that the ravens have left, the great king will emerge and lead Germany on a great conquest, annihilating our enemies and establishing German domination the world over. Will he kill them all, Grandfather? The British? The Italians? The French? Every last one! Even the Slavs? Especially the Slavs. Sweet! List really hated the Slavs. Hitler also didn't die. Tupac didn't either. I think all these people are dead. I think they're all just chilling together, having some mimosas in the morning. Wherever yeah. dead people well, are. I've they seen work a at the YouTube Arby's video on Canal. That oh, they work at the Arby's out here in the Eastern alive. Shore. I want to hope Tupac's alive. List's swastika uh, came from his study and creation of a set of runes, which were probably inspired by Blavatsky, and they're the reason Brianna's here Say today. It. She's runes? getting weed up already. <laughs> runes were an ancient Celtic form of lettering. Sound good so far? Yes. Uh, that modern occultists have come to believe have magical power. Still mm, sound good? Yes. Okay. The belief that letters had power goes back to the Kabbalah. 
according to ancient mm-hmm. Jewish mystical tradition, mm, <laughs> letters correspond to numbers in a way uh, that lets us discover secret correspondences. It's called uh, gematria. So if the value of the numbers in the word eggplant match the numbers in your name, you must be a little bit like an eggplant. Isn't that what I they did so. with like uh, Julius Caesar? It was like the six 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 is the the, mar- the number of the beast because of the letters and the numbers. So he was the antichrist. His name. Supposedly, I think that's what somebody was trying to well, tell me. Well, that's scripture in Christian yeah. Catholic school. <laughs> He's, huh. Julius Caesar was the antichrist. He rose to power. Supposedly. Well, that was a long time ago. Yeah, we're pretty, so we're in the yeah. clear. Yeah. 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 Wow. So we're in the post like look at us. Right. This, yeah, is, a, this, this is, is longer hell. than I expected in Revelation, though, for Jesus to come back. Right. Hmm. Okay. Weird. They're teaching you that. Yeah, somebody said it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a. They were a teacher. There, okay. Okay. Huh. So again, don't put this in your book report. So List came up with his runes in 1902 after cataract surgery. <laughs> that seems like such an unfortunate time. Well, what else are you gonna do though? Just sit around and imagine runes. But can't see. Runes. But you. Which are visual. I agree. But yeah. Uh, you... But you're just sitting there. Like, what else are you doing? Why would you visualize something when you can't see? He was blind for 11 months, and <sighs> during that time, he discovered these runes by seeing with his inner eye. Is he eye. trying to be Odin or some you, shit? When your like brain what? isn't being stimulated by, by outside source like your eye, the brain on the inside stimulates stuff for you. There He's you go, just yeah. copying Odin in a modern form, in a less divine form. I'm sure he knew that, too. Yeah, he was all right <laughs> with it. He was fine. He had 11 months to kill. So I he, don't like him. So. <laughs> well, you are cursed at him in Russian already, so. Ah! There's a total of uh, 18 runes corresponding with the 18 wisdoms mentioned in the Edda. The Edda. The Edda. It's an Edda. Edda. Is it E D D A? Yeah, it's, it's an Edda. It. Uh, go ahead. What is that? It's pretty much Norse religious books, but 18 is not the correct number. Hmm. You want to curse at him again in a different language? Ah. Uh. I don't know. How so, so this German guy was like, I can 18. say more curse words in Russian. I just shouted shit at him in French. Dermot. <laughs> <laughs> Yabluko. Shit in Russian. <laughs> what a weird game we're playing yeah. now. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I did. What so I the, the Eda, as Brianna mentioned, Book of Icelandic or Viking there's mythology. technically two, but there's a third that's considered, but not really like. A... The Book of Mormon. Yeah, the Book of Mormon is the third Eda. <laughs> Right? Uh, you know, is that right, Smith. Brianna? Is that historically I'm accurate? Sorry, I'm sorry. I couldn't. I couldn't. Resist. Who is the Joseph Smith of of Denmark? <laughs> <laughs> she she looks to be thinking very hard. Yeah, she's really trying to come up with who the Joseph James, Smith of Denmark is. James, I never thought is. someone would break me this much in my life. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> we may never so hear trivial. the metal sound again. Uh, you may be familiar with the stories of Odin, Loki, and Thor. Is this is this reviving you? Odin, Loki, and Thor. Odin, Depends Loki. on the stories and what you try to say they are. Well, I'm not going to say anything about them, just <laughs> that right. they exist. And I'm not going to say that Joseph Smith wrote them. <laughs> no, it's it's just going to be a them. trigger warning for me the whole time, isn't it, Rob? Uh, the J- Jorgen, Jorgensen Smith. Because that's the German. Because he's Danish. I don't okay, know. Danish, I don't know what a okay. Danish name is. List believed that these. Were, I don't think we have any Danish listeners, so I'm apparently not worried about it. I hope not. <laughs> List believed that these were also the root myths of the Austro-German races. That what were the root? The, what your the what the Eda, Loki, and etc. And that the, the Germans, the Nazis are going to love this. They love all the Norse mythology. Yeah, uh, I know. These runes Weird. were the symbols that crystallized this wisdom, according to the list. The 18th and ultimate rune, the Gibor. Gibber. Gibber. The Gibber. Gibber. Is the Gibber. G I B O R. Isn't that a name for Regan? That is, is not. It? Don't look at me. I don't know anything the about Gibber him. because he gibs. <laughs> the, the, oh, okay. The he's talking about the swastika. I, think he's the I was like not thinking the of. Individual runes. In any the swastika set, isn't an individual rune. The Gibor, the Gibor, that was the swastika is the point I'm trying to make. Yes. Which has nothing to do with Ronald Reagan. What? Okay. Wait, what? The you th- missed it. Don't worry about it. Wait, it was James and I were doing this while you guys were looking at the word. This is just for our listeners. It was a private thing between us and all of the people who listen to this podcast. <laughs> all right. This group sponsored the DAP, or German Workers' Party, who later reorganized as the National... Socialist Democratic Workers' Party under the leadership of... Adolf Hitler. Hitler! (laughs) Nazis! 
Boo. No. Yeah, it's not. Boo? I think it's right. Boo. Boo. That's my, like, Ow. like if I opened the door like Jerry Seinfeld and they were there. Nazi. Ah. Ah. So, uh, step one. Figure out where the swastika came from. We did that. Good job. The swastika came from Helena Blavatsky, and then it was adopted by List, and then we cursed at him in several languages. And then it was taken up by the Thule Society, and then that became the German Workers' Party, and then Hitler got it. <sighs> that was some great nutshelling, Rob. That was yep. like... Really feeling, good. Everybody's feeling all right about that? Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's turn our attention to the most, most occult of Hitler's generals, Heinrich Himmler. Hmm. Let's get started with a brief history. I'm going to invite Brandon and Olivia over to the circle to walk us through this particular brief history. Brandon Walls, who's usually uh, our one of our main guys as a voice actor, is going to come in and do the brief history for us today. Hello. And uh, Olivia is going to be uh, doing the voice uh, of the history as well. Yep. History Y'all voice. Get to suffer along. Yes, because we like to hear Olivia attempt to pronounce today German words. Yeah, but I think um, today might be okay. Feeling strong about German words? We'll see. Okay, because I don't know how to pronounce German words, so. Oh, great. You're on your own. Great. Okay. We don't have any German listeners, right? Uh, unless they're, like, hidden in Canada or Australia, because, you know, Nazis are hidden all over. Mostly South America. Well. Anyway. If, you, if there are any Nazi listeners out there. Please stop listening. This is not for you. No. I will butcher all of <laughs> yes, things just you Yes, just to piss you off. Yeah. Nazi listener. Today's brief history is on Heinrich Himmler's crazy projects. So uh, we're drawing in part here on Peter Longerich's biography of Himmler. Um, As commander of the SS, Himmler was in charge of Germany's police force and set up and controlled Hitler's concentration camps. Okay, so let's hear about his connection to weird projects. Crazy projects. Crazy, oh yes, crazy projects. Himmler's SS came from a variety of professions and social backgrounds, and so Himmler's first project was to create community among them. But this was a constant project since the SS was constantly expanding. Himmler's SS was funded initially through membership dues, but later through a group of friends of the SS from the German business world. Funders came from banking, manufacturing, and shipping. The SS got into business for itself with a publishing house and porcelain factory, where they made SS kitsch... Kitsch. 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 Kitschy stuff. Kitschy campy. Kitsch. Like figurines. Hmm. Hummels. Including soldiers, the furs rust, and the rutting stag. Oh, wait, so go back to do that again. Do that. I don't, I don't want to miss any of this. So uh, he, he made little figurines of... Go ahead. Uh, soldiers. Soldiers. The fur... Fur... Furers... Hmm. The Führer. I have a hard time the saying Führer's the word. The Führer's bust. Yep. So Hitler. Yep. Hitler from the neck up. Or from the, the shoulders up. And... The Rutting Stag. The Rutting Stag. I just don't want us to miss the Rutting Stag. Yeah. Does that mean it's humping? I don't know. What is a Rutting Stag? I it, don't know. I, no I was clue. hoping you were going to tell me. Hump? I, I just think it's delightful. I love the concept of a Rutting Stag. I think it means it's like looking for love. I kind of want to look it up later, but I'm a little scared. To rut. Sounds like it's humping something. But I don't think it's just one stag. You have got the PhD. In any, I'm not, not in biology, zoology. I trust you. Go on. In the early 1930s, Himmler considered Christians as dangerous as Freemasons and communists, Jews and homosexuals, in keeping from the rise of the Aryan Germanic races from taking the place. Makes complete sense. Oh. Right, because right, they weren't pagan. They were Christian. The Christians had, you know, killed all that sweet German paganism. Mm. The Asians eventually joined the group of enemies, but he also believed that Asian groups sent for Germanic Nordic leaders to help organize them such that Himmler believed that Genghis Khan, Lenin, and Stalin all had Aryan roots. I love the Genghis Khan in there. Right. Yeah. Like, so you'll believe that Lenin and Stalin had Aryan roots, but I Genghis like... Khan is a bridge too far? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so like the German, these ancient German occult masters, whatever, like just like spread out to go spread their wisdom and, you know, birth Genghis Khan. I feel like Lenin would hate being Aryan, yeah, Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. That would they go found against... out, yeah, they, yeah, would, they, were... they would not be pleased. <laughs> yeah. As far as religion, he was open to any practice that had practical benefit. Although the pacifist Jehovah's Witnesses were confined to concentration camps because of their pacifism, he admired their steadfast resistance to Nazi rule and frugality and employed them in his house. Yeah, yeah. so like, he had a concentration camp full of Jehovah's Witnesses, and he was like, 
These guys are okay. They'll make good housekeepers. Yeah, you, you can come take care of my, serve me tea. That's so rude. Yeah. yeah. And he formed a regiment of Muslims who were good fighters because they believed they would be rewarded in heaven for dying on the battlefield. Yeah. That's very upsetting. Yeah, they basically <laughs> used people's religious beliefs to segment them off into these various labor projects. Oh my God. Projects. Yeah. Well, back to the Christians. Back to the Christians. As always. Himmler envisioned a de-Christianization Nice. Wow. Well with that one. I can't That's believe a word. that. Christianization. And replacement of Christian with Germanic values. Right. This didn't mean an atheistic revolution. Damn it. Himmler believed in God and even privately toyed with the Nordic Wo- Wotan. Wotan. Wotan as the true god of his Germanic religion. Right. So the ancient Nordic god was the real god. We hmm. need to get back to back to Wotan. Was that just another word for Odin? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Initially, he sought to replace what he viewed as the homosexual tyranny of the Catholic priesthood and then Christian marriage itself with a more open breeding program. Yeah, it's more in the line with the sort of eugenic program, right? Where we're uh, breeding for the good of the race, yeah. So That was a very nice way of putting that. Yep. A more open breeding program. Well, it, it's like polyamory in a certain yeah. way, but you're being paired according to your genetic traits. He put his publishers to work researching a pre-Christian history of Germany. He blamed St. Boniface's chopping down of the mythic donor tree? Mm -hmm. Donar tree? Donor? In 723, and Charlemagne for the fall of the Germanic people to Christianization. Christian, damn it, I messed it up that time. You cut down the mystical tree and killed the German people's pagan roots. Mm. That's rude as hell. Yeah, damn it, Boniface. In addition to reframing history, Himmler developed a new science for the Reich in his adoption of cosmic ice theory, or Weltschirrschire. Weit, weit, weit. Let me see. It's a Welt, Weltschirr. Welt, 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 Yes. Yeah. Dodge Chrysler. <laughs> it had initially come to Austrian engineer Hans Horbiger. In a dream in 1894. So this is cosmic ice theory that we're talking about. We got we were spent so much time pronouncing it that we forgot that we're, what we're talking <laughs> yes. about. So this is uh, the Germans believed in cosmic ice theory. So it came to this Austrian initially. Mm-hmm. And for Horbiger, ice was the central stuff that went to make up the universe. The solar system was formed when a water star collided with our fire star, the sun, and re- and the resulting condensation formed planets and moons like our own. Our ice moon is not our only one historically. Others have crashed into the earth, causing cataclysms like the one that killed the lost city of Atlantis. Ah. Up for debate. Yeah, way, way occulty. But yeah, this is—he says it's all. Everything is ice. The moon is made of ice. This is cosmic ice, ice theory. We, yeah, well, Earth, yeah, came from this ice, icy collision with the sun. And Hitler and Himmler both embraced cosmic ice theory yeah, as an alternative yeah. to the Jewish Einstein's relativity. Yeah, oh, all no. of those. Oh, Einstein with all his, you uh. know, gravity and. And matter and stuff. No, no, no. It's ice. This it's is magic like flat ice. Flat earthers is what I feel like this is. <laughs> Identifying with their Nordic and Germanic ancestors who grew up in ice and snow, a theory made ice the material heart of the universe went over well with the Nazis. Right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, they're okay. they're they're an icy people. So ice is the the cosmic root of everything. That's just cold. <laughs> Brandon got a pun in. Yay! Nice. Good job. And, and that's, that's a, a brief history of Heinrich Himmler's crazy SS projects. Oh, you guys. <laughs> you <laughs> silly guys. <laughs> SS Reichsfuhrer, Reich, Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler had a passion for the occult. As a student of the occult, he selected the twin lightning bolts as the symbol for the SS from among List's 18 runes. He also developed a ring, the Totenkopfring, for his SS members. The ring featured a death's head and a series of specially selected runes. When a member died, the ring was returned to Himmler, where it was carefully preserved as the symbol of the individual's enduring membership in the community. Now, Brianna uh, has done some research on this ring for us. I didn't us. even have to do any research. I just looked at it. And, and we're going to go ahead and post it, it up great. on all of our sites so you can find like pictures whole, of the SS a ring. A whole board of uh, this so, yeah, that I've done. Brianna's done a, an illustration, which we will also post on Instagram because you all cannot see it right now. Uh, huh. But can you walk our listeners through the various runes 
Would you like me to start at the SS? Yeah, we're, we're all going to close our eyes so you don't rely on, on this board here, though, because our listeners can't see it. So let's understand the Toten... I'm still going to look at the board, though. <laughs> Totenkopfring. Go so, ahead. So, starting with the SS, mm -hmm. that section has a lightning bolt, a lightning bolt, and an arrow that's hashed. Okay? On the ring. Yes. That's how they appear. This is one section of the ring. Okay. There's... Where, where are we at on the ring on the top? Opposite of the death head. Okay, so, all right. Does this look like, like a class ring? Is it, is it like a is class it ring? Is it like a big, thick no, class ring? No, it's like thing? kind of like, it's a band. A band. Oh. But it's, like a it's, wedding band. But it's a carved band, yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's a big, thick, carved wedding band full yeah. of symbols. Yeah. Okay, so we start, we have the Where's SS, and we have this arrow. Yeah, and so that SS, they're actually called um, Solo. That's okay. the name of the rune. Okay. Um, it literally can stand for an S as well. But, uh, so, that dude, he pretty much represents strength and stability, and since there's two, it's kind of a crossing of the both. Okay, so the arrow is strength and stability? No, the SS. The SS is strength mm -hmm. and stability, okay. The arrow is actually two separate runes. Okay. Tyr and Ansuas. Okay. So, those are, like, pretty important. So, Tyr is the rune of the warrior, and Ansuas is the rune of the messenger, and, um, hence has an alternative meaning of vitality. But the thing is that I don't get is that it's backwards on the arrow. So it. <laughs> well, they flipped a lot of stuff. The swastika. Yeah, they flipped and all the swastika. That, yeah. Maybe they were they did it in a mirror or something. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know That's why just, I think they would guess, reverse Jay, it though. What happened there? <laughs> because it would have an adverse meaning then, which would make no sense. Well, let's carry on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You want me to go to the swastika or the other? I want the one that looks like an anus. All right. Yeah. For the anus rune. That's yeah. another combination of two runes. Um, which, our brief history allows this to make so much more sense. Yes. Um, it's a combination of two runes called Gifu and Essa. All right. Which is an X and a line. Yes. And. Like an asterisk or an anus. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Both Gefu literally translates to gift, so it's a gift of sorts. But Essa means ice or a stillness in time. Ah. So I would take this as ice as a gift because they had that whole thing surrounding ice and the cosmic formation. ice theory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's where that plays. Right after the ass, <laughs> the, the anus, asshole, yeah. the anus, uh, right before death's head is a solo, but by itself. Sulo, so that's just one of the SSS's. Yes. Okay. Lightning so bolt. Lightning bolt. So yeah, together, they yeah. represent strength and stability, but when separated like they are on either side of the death's head, it's guidance and clarity. Ah. Mm -hmm. So guidance and clarity for our strength. Yes. Yeah. Leadership sort of thing. Okay. Which I think that's how Himmler viewed the SS, yes. that they would be the sort of leaders of the new Germany. Mm -hmm. mm. And then the swastika. Now this way, the swastika. Go ahead. So it's actually a Norse symbol, too. Right. It's a symbol of divinity, of the gods, pretty much. Um, so, so he was right that this was a kind of rune. Yeah. Okay. It's not one within the set of the quote-unquote alphabetic runes. Okay. It's a separate one that's a combination rune of two of the SSs. Oh, oh kind of like... Actually, like no, not the adjacent. SSs. It's a combination of Iwas. Iwas is very similar. It also looks like an SS, but... It has... Um, it's more like a ZZ. Yeah, it is more like yeah, a ZZ. Yeah, it's more like a ZZ. Yeah. Pretty like much. Like ZZ Top. Right. That's. Oh, I hope that has... ZZ Top has I nothing hope... to do with that. I bet they had no idea. I hope the sharp-dressed <laughs> man is not wearing a Nazi armband. That would be terrible. <laughs> they are very sharply dressed, though. Mm -hmm. But they don't wear Nazi armbands. And they wear I a lot of facial hair. Nazis. And Nazis Hitler only had that tiny mustache. Mm. Whereas ZZ Top had very long beards. <laughs> <laughs> so they are not Nazis. Yeah. Hot take. The ZZ Top are not Nazis. Nazis. I never, I've never seen you get this so uh, worked up. Right? I, don't, I don't have strong <laughs> feelings about ZZ Top, so I don't understand where this is coming from. <laughs> it's just some deep set. Like, I, don't know. I guess I have strong feelings about people with long beards. I being Nazis. So. <laughs> or not being Nazis. Or not being Although Nazis. Although I, I have a very short beard. Anyway. So, the swastika, uh, they're pretty much roping themselves up to God level with it. By the SS as shall their, be the new gods. Yeah, that's pretty much what they're doing. Cool, thank you. Yeesh. Woo! Should I mention that I've brought my my personal Nazi um, 
Do you have a personal Nazi? <laughs> no. My personal Nazi, Nazi researcher. Oh, your Nazi researcher. Nazi researcher Nick. Is a researcher of Nazis, not yes. a Nazi who's also no. a researcher. He okay. researches right. Nazi. He is my personal okay, we've Nazi got, researcher. We've got Nick Ross backing yes. Brianna up on, on these, these ideas and theories here. Yes. Uh, yes. I thought I would mention him. Okay, cool. At appropriate time. Yes. <laughs> Nick is a World War II reenactor and knows many He's things right behind about, me. About oh. Hey, Nick, say hi. Good night. He said All something right. in said, some foreign said, language. Yeah, maybe he knows some German. Sticking true. We should have been checking in with him all along about these pronunciations. Uh, his, <laughs> why come you're just bringing him up now, Brianna? You know. I was wondering who was sitting behind you. <laughs> no, we all know Nick. Uh, his personal occult... Okay, so getting back to Himmler. He had a personal occult consigliere. <laughs> which is my word. Which is a mafia word. It's not my word. It's a mafia word. I love that word. For your next in command, or your, your guy who's running the show with you, helping you run the show. First mate. Right first mate, yeah. First mate of the table. <laughs> uh, a man by the name of Karl Maria Villegut. 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 Believed that, what, what do we think? Villegut. W I L I G U T. Villegut. Villegut. See, now we're going to check with Nick. Yeah, we should have been doing that. Villegut believed that German prehistory dated to 20, 228,000 BCE. When mythical beings like giants and dwarves roamed the earth, and there were three suns in the sky, fun times. Hmm. Around Sounds the year, hot. <laughs> yeah, pretty, it was hot times. Hot yeah, times. Hot times. In more ways than one. And it gets hotter. Right. Around the year twelve thousand five hundred, the Erminist religion of Christ, K R I S T, Christ sounds familiar. Like Christ. Ah, was established and became the Germans' universal faith. This annoyed the Wotanists, worshippers of Odin, the Norse yeah. god whose mythology was favored by List. I'm not sure what is the best god. I mean, who's the best god? Well, it's obviously Chris, man. Yes. Yeah, so obviously it's Chris. It's the only one to choose. Nobody else has anything on Chris. No, no, no. Have no, you he's heard he's of Wotan? Wotan no one the else man. matters. All right. It is Where? Wotan all the time, forever. Right, right. I don't think so. I think that Chris is the best. Oh, Wotan way. the man's the worst nickname I've ever heard for a god, okay? I, I just come out to this field looking for my dog, and I kind of <laughs> wanted to find a god as well. No, he just jokes so Chris is a stupid name. You no, know, no, like, no, it's not. No, Wotan is a stupid Wotan name. Man, Wotan quote, unquote, man. a terrible name for So a, a civil war yeah. followed, and the Wotanists crucified the Erminist prophet Baldur Crestos. Na, 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 na. <laughs> Christianity is metal? Yeah, but or, it's sorry, also... sorry, not Christianity. Crucifixion. It, Notice that yeah, he's put this all... Yeah, crucifixion is always metal. In time, he's put this far, much further back in time than Christianity, which only dates to 2,000 years ago. But yes, Boulder Cresto certainly sounds like something like Christ, right? And it's the religion of Christ, of Christ. So it, it feels like what he's done is take the Christian religion and say, no, wait a second. That's really plagiarizing this thing that happened much earlier and screwed the German people up. Mm. Uh, Bolter Crestos survived his crucifixion. God damn it. <laughs> and ran off to Asia, where he preached his religion, which was eventually perverted into... Christianity. There you are, Christianity. It's so less metal. Villagut was not your average occult consigliere. I don't know what your average occult consigliere would be. I don't, I don't even know. know what that means. I mean, you're, <laughs> that kind you're of my guy. occult consigliere. Are you the god, my godfather? Uh, no. <laughs> if you're asking me to be your child's grandfather, godfather, grandfather, then... I don't think you could legally be anyone's grandfather if you don't have grandchildren. Well, if you don't want to even try, then that's fine, whatever. I, I think... feel like it could be accomplished. <clears throat> he was also, Villigat was also a wild and crazy guy. Before he joined the SS, his wife had him involuntarily committed to the Salzburg Mental Asylum. You thought I meant crazy like he's out partying, didn't you? Yeah, I did, I did. <laughs> no, I, I was hoping uh, for insanity. Where he was diagnosed uh, with uh, something. The Aryan Germanic disease? <laughs> I saw that somewhere. Where are we? Diagnosed with the symbols. That with megalomania. Uh -oh. oh, shit. Megalomania. I've heard of that, but I don't know what it means. I'm going to tell you. Oh, good. Where he was diagnosed with megalomania... Oh, shit. I don't know what that means. I'm going to tell you. Mean? And paranoid delusions. <laughs> That's, I'll tip megalomania. So on that, he believed he was descended from Villagotis. Yes, Nick back there? Villagotis? Okay. Or wise kings and may have been the last of them. So basically a megalomaniac believes that he's at the center of the universe. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. 
In 1932, he gave up his family and fled from Austria to Germany, where he became a celebrity among Germany's rune occultists. The following year, he joined the SS under the pseudonym Weisthor. W-E-I-S Thor. Weisthor. 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 Are you slut-shaming him, James? <laughs> that was not my intention. So he's using that pseudonym to uh, avoid the stigma of his having been committed to a mental asylum. So he changes his name so nobody can catch on. He helped uh, Heinrich Himmler, leader of the SS, to locate and establish a new training center styled as a revival of Germany's ancient Teutonic Knights, the Velvelsberg Castle in the mythical Teutoburger Forest. What are these names? I know, Germany's German. an intense this place. This doesn't sound like a real place. I know Germany's real, but all this is yeah, like... Yeah, it's all real. This is all so real. It sounds so fake. Himmler's Magus, namely Weisthor, namely Villiget, both the same guy, <laughs> predicted... <laughs> one I days. know, it's getting confusing. Okay, so this dude predicted that the castle, the Velvilsburg Castle, would prove the stronghold of a future German force in a cataclysmic war between the Aryans and the Asians. Himmler believed that a great East-West confrontation was inevitable within the next 200 years and embraced Villiget, now Weisthor's, theory that this castle would be central to the Germans' victory. So in like 200 years, there's going to be an epic battle here. Hmm. One of the central rumors about the castle was that Himmler imagined it as a place to recreate the legendary Knights of the Round Table. He had named rooms after King Arthur and the Holy Grail. Nerd. I feel like all these Nazis were just trying to role play. Like, that's all yeah. that, they just needed a good Except play. that it got really dark. Oh, yeah, well, they took really... it way too seriously. Yeah, they took the role playing too far. It always goes too far. <laughs> right? That's LARPing gone wrong. Which is across the whole country. D &D and right, then they the whole... started LARPing with foam swords, and then they started using real swords, and it got worse and worse. The number 12 was significant to Himmler. The Wait, SS had. Rob, well, yeah. The funny thing is, is there's actually, like, a Christian comic that's made about, like, it's, it's like, pretty much being, like, uh, d like, any role playing thing is, like, to Satan. Well, it gets to Hitler. First word. Hitler, then Satan. <laughs> There's literally a comic that was that was written about this. This guy did all this all. The alt right time. Christian stuff is often like first Hitler then Satan. But like this was. They put them all in the same bucket. <laughs> this was about role playing. This was about, about role playing, playing in particular. Yeah, well, there was that the like satanic panic in D &D. the nineties. Right, we're getting yeah. there. Next episode yes. preview. Yes, so, yeah. <laughs> On the next Occult Confessions. So, but on this Occult Confessions, <laughs> the number 12, back to Himmler and his castle arrangements, his castle interior decoration, which we're all fascinated by, was significant to Himmler. The SS had 12 departments with 12 leaders who may have been Himmler, Himmler's legendary 12 knights of the round table. The design for the castle's north tower featured a vault with 12 pedestals, 12 pillars, and 12 spokes on the sun wheel. Weisthor former Lee Villigat, developed pagan wedding ceremonies, solstice rites, created a crypt for SS officers at the castle. Himmler imagined transforming it into a great Nazi Vatican, where Villigat Weisthor's religion could be centered and celebrated. Do you know why twelve? Why he kept bringing up 12? Because of the Knights of the Table Round. Okay, I was going to say, He believed they were 12. Thing. Yeah, 12. It's not a Norse thing. He, he had a King Arthur thing going, too. What? Can you just of the make LARPing up his he mind? Did. He LARPed King Arthur. <laughs> so indecisive. As for those of our listeners who are not familiar with LARPing, uh, it's an acronym standing for Live Action Role Playing. But since I believe we're very popular among Wiccans and, and various other uh, fantasy enthusiasts, I'm going to guess that you guys are able to parse that. How has Nazis turned into LARPing? Because that's what he's doing! Th it's he's what, LARPing! That's he's how LARPing started. King Arthur. He's doing a King Arthur LARP. A LAR LARTHER. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, I apologize. I apologize to everyone for that. You should. <laughs> I'm glad you did. <laughs> that was so bad. I reached for it. It was too close to the sun. I was reaching yeah, too close right. to the sun. Should have stopped while I was ahead. As Vicethor Villigat grew in power, jealous enemies cropped up to topple him. They tracked down his ex-wife in Salzburg and exposed his three-year stint in the asylum. Ouch. I thought they were going to do something a lot worse. You know, all you have to do is that. <laughs> Uh, after that, Himmler was forced to distance himself from his magus, but he really didn't want to. Weisthor's official retirement from the SS dated to 1939. Himmler dissolved his office and sentimentally kept his ring, his dagger, and his sword under lock and key. After the Allied forces invaded, the English assigned him to a refugee camp where he suffered a stroke and lost his speech. 
He returned to his family home in Austria, but found himself deeply unhappy there and longed to return to Germany. But the trip was too much for his frail old body, and Vice Thor Villigat died when he arrived. How old was he? It was the 3rd of January, 1946. That doesn't tell me how old he is, Rob. But that's the information that that's we have. Not this, really. I don't have that fact. <laughs> I he cannot Did I say his birthday? He was, it was, he was too no. old for Well, the then we can't do the know. math. He was old. He was an old dude. Well, and the war was also sure. over, so... And he had had a stroke. It was, he had a rough time. But good. Let's move on. The Ostara, part three. The Ostara. This is the nice... Uh, we're in the home stretch now. Yep, here, yes, you remember... Now we come to the strangest and probably most important chapter in the story of Nazi occultism. The magazines that inspired Adolf Hitler's own beliefs. Of course, Hitler never admitted to reading any trashy occult magazines. <laughs> and his biographers generally chalk up his belief in a master race to people like Nietzsche and Wagner. Nietzsche, the philosopher, Wagner, the mm. opera composer. Because that's you know way more high class than a bunch of trashy magazines. The Weekly World News. <laughs> Is that what it was called? No. no. Okay. Uh, it was called the Ostara. Certainly, uh, Wagner and so Nietzsche. The Ostara. Uh, Wagner and Nietzsche had something to say about a master race. They did. That's true. And they had strong opinions about the significance of Germany's Volk culture. Volk, the sort of German word for folk. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know Hitler liked to go to the opera, where Wagner would have exposed him to all kinds of mythological symbols and stories, along with a Volkish ideology. All that Norse stuff. But it's also true that a certain magazine, the Ostara, was circulating widely among right-wingers who held to Hitler's views. Hitler had been born to a customs agent on the Austro-Bavarian border in 1889. My apologies to anyone who watches the History Channel. I am now going to do a brief history of Hitler myself. <laughs> but second brief history. He moved to Vienna to train as an artist, where in 1907 he was rejected from art school. That Christmas, his mother died, and he took to living the life of a bohemian artist. He refused to work at anything other than art, and over the next year found himself destitute, living in the poorest part of the city. In 1909, the same year Aleister Crowley went out into the desert, I just want to point that out, young Hitler entered the office of the Ostara, where he met the magazine's publisher, uh, Georg Lanz von Liebenfels. Lanz reported that Hitler told him he'd been enjoying his magazine and wanted to see if he could pay him for some back issues. Seeing how poor the young man looked, Lanz gave him the issues at no charge and two crowns for the bus fare back downtown. A nice thing to do, except when you think that it's for Hitler. Yeah, right, well, he wasn't <laughs> Hitler I mean, at that then. point. He was just a young guy. He was just some But he was, was Hitler. Well, he was Adolf. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, Hitler is my father. No, why did I do that accent? It's a terrible accent. It's kind of Russian. Yeah. Uh, it's unlikely we're no good at accents. We're not good at dialect here in Occult Confessions, and we know that. It's unlikely Lanz would have invented this story, given the fact that political investigations against former Nazis were still underway at this time period. So we're basically in, it's 1951. Uh, so there's a bunch of the, we're, we're actively pursuing Nazis and putting them on trial. And Lanz is like, oh yeah, I knew Hitler. So <laughs> historically, <laughs> the, like the incentive was for him to be like, no, I never heard of him. But instead he says, yeah, I, I knew him. And he came to my office and he bought these magazines. So I think the story kind of checks out. And a couple of young scholars went to the offices of the, Ost uh, well, not the offices of the Ostar, but went to Liebenfels, von Liebenfels, and got this story straight from him. So, Georges Lanz von Liebenfels, much like Liszt, had styled himself an aristocrat, but was only born middle class. Oh, so he added the von. Yep, all these von adders. He became obsessed with the Knights Templar as a young man, which inspired him to join the Cisterian Order at Highland Kreutz Abbey. Doing Heiden, good back there, Nick? Okay. How do you feel about my Hitler bio? It's pretty accurate. Okay, cool. What, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. He says he said pretty good, pretty good on that Hitler bio there. Yeah, if he approves. <laughs> I approve. Okay, all right. So, way to ride those coattails. Yep. Uh, <laughs> know you're Hitler, man. So he, <laughs> I, I don't really. So I keep him around. Okay. So, uh, so he joins this this these monks at Highland Kreutz Abbey, where he is inducted as Brother Georg in 1893. George Georg, close enough. Uh, they excavated a tombstone at the Abbey in 1894, depicting a knight treading on a humanesque beast that sort of looked like a tiny sphinx without the mane. Lanz... Ew. 
<laughs> I don't, I don't want to imagine that. It's okay. weird. Get that out of your head then. So okay. we, oh, God. I, I'm over No, it. stop imagining. Tiny <laughs> Sphinx without a mane. I can't. You tiny can Sphinx it. without a mane. Quit straight up imagining the Tiny Sphinx without a mane. Lons interpreted this graveyard image as a message about evil, with the knight coming to represent the white Aryan races, and the beast, the various races that were not white, including, James, I'm sorry about this, the Mediterraneanoids. That's fine. I just never call me Mediterraneanoid again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just call me Mediterranean. That's fine. Okay. The oid is unnecessary. That's what threw you off. <laughs> it was kind of gross sounding. Yeah. Anyway. Lons argued that ancient cultures had maintained a sexual secret associated with orgiastic rituals, sort of like the Bacchants or Maenads we talked about in our the first episode of our second series, uh, the pagan orgies and witch cult stuff. All right, yeah. That was fun. It was. Have a listen, if you haven't. Uh, he studied a pair of excavated reliefs depicting Assyrians leading strange cr- creatures on leashes as pets and decided that these creatures were pygmies. Pygmies? are a human subpopulation no taller than 60 inches, roughly in 5 Africa? feet. Africa? Yes. <laughs> the Syrians were in, like, the Middle East, right? right? But somehow they got them. You know, so they're in Central Africa, New Guinea, and they're also in the Philippines. Um, they mostly live according to tribal traditions today, and they hunt and they gather. In Western culture, they were described by the poets Homer and Herodotus, a Greek historian dating to the 5th century. So let's hear for a moment about from Herodotus on these pygmies, and then we'll figure out what von Liebenfels had to say about them. This is the strangest thing, I think, that we're discussing today. All right, Herodotus, you're on. And so, the youths came upon the beast lands, and from there they went through to the wasteland, making their way against the westerly wind. And having gone through much sandy land for many days, they saw at last trees growing in a plain, and when they went to it and touched the fruit that was on the trees, And small men came towards those who touched the fruit, smaller than average men, who took them and led them through a very large marsh. And having gone through it, they arrived at a city in which everyone was, with respect to size, like those who led them, and black of skin. A great river flowed to the city, and it flowed from the west towards the rising sun, and crocodiles could be seen in it. I I guess there are real around that around like Greece and in Lebanon area a long time ago and the Assyrians kind of maybe like cut them out because if the Greeks have stories of them how do they get stories of the pygmies from the Philippines or, or Central Africa mm. they were they, they, they must were have bopping been, around they yeah. must yeah. have been around and there was some travel the too we had boats and stuff yeah and North Africa is not only right there yeah, but not under the Sahara it was well, across yeah. the Sahara well Lons believed that the ancient Aryans had kept these pygmies as sex pets oh Oh no. Why? Now imagine your maneless tiny sphinx <laughs> as a sex pet. The Aryans committed, which pygmies do not look like that, by the way, but yeah, that's no. what it looked like on the tombstone. The Aryans committed what Lons called bestiality with these pets, but they're people. It's... And this interbreeding caused the genetic corruption of the Aryan race. Yeah. According to Lons, the ancient Aryans spent a lot of their free time breeding love pygmies to sex up. Wait a minute. All right. Hold on. This is so. Stupid. And the whole Old Testament was written down to warn the Aryans to quit breeding pygmies as sex pets. So they... What? What? So they sex the pygmies up and then they complain about corruption of the... They're they're doing it if this is... I don't understand. The argument went that Moses was a Darwinist whose teachings were appropriated by the Jews to achieve the same racial purity that Moses had like intended for Moses, the Aryans. Moses, Moses. Moses, Moses. Big old Moses with his snake stick and his blood water. I have a neighbor who looks like <laughs> Moses. Blood water. Okay. <laughs> the original Aryans were supermen with telepathic powers that operated through the active manipulation of electrical waves. Oh my I'm god. Where, where is, what's the source on that one? <laughs> yeah. Von Liebenhell's mind. Okay, so the 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 freaking the magazine publisher. Guy. Yeah, this is still Lons von okay. Liebenhell's. Yeah, like just but all the, so, but all the interbreeding had atrophied our magical a- uh, electrical organs down to the now comparatively useless pituitary and pineal glands. What? Yeah. I don't think either of those are useless, though. No, they're very useful. But I don't I think, use them every day. <laughs> I don't think you can use them to manipulate electrical waves, is his point. 
The only people remaining who had any lingering trace of their Aryan electrical powers were the German aristocracy. But a new day was dawning when the Aryan race would soon return. They were such nerds. A new priesthood will arise in the land of the Electron and the Holy Grail. Great princes, doughty warriors, inspired priests, eloquent bards, and visionary sages will arise from the ancient holy soil of Germany and chain the apes of Sodom, establish the church of the Holy Spirit, and transform the earth into the Isle of the Blessed. This episode's gonna break. <laughs> if only they had, like, a good comic book to, like, delve into instead of, like, the aristocracy. In Lanz's view, women were an especially thorny problem because they <sighs> lusted thorny. after the inferior races. You ladies and your lust for the inferior races. Thanks? You love I, them. What, what do you mean by inferior races? You love the interbreeded <laughs> pygmy spawn. But they've created themselves. They, they I know. corrupted themselves. Yeah, they but now, now women really want to have sex with all the... N- Non Aryans. They're complaining yeah, t- about the corruption of the. You have a races, taste for that they, interbred pygmy blood. They did it themselves. But now you want to sex them. And that makes the German aris- aristocrats jealous? That and makes angry. them. It makes them angry. It, it deprives them of their electrical powers. Maybe I just want to sex when I want to sex. Why do you gotta I'd care? have powers if you would just love me. They- <laughs> So those women had to be very strictly controlled by their Aryan husbands, or Aww. they'd go around sexing themselves all over the first pygmies they could get their hands on. Why? I know Why, though? True. What is the premise for this? Why do they assume that women are going to be like, oh, let me sex up these pygmies? Well, like, this what? Is, I mean, this isn't terribly strange. In the United States, there was panic over the interaction between white women and black men, particularly in the Confederate States. Right? A lot of the... What, what, what's that movie? The Birth of a Nation... Mm. is around this sort of like mythology of the black man violating the white woman. We're seeing the same theme here, really, translated over into Europe. The women's lust was so unmanageable that Lanz von Liebenthal's thought the only way to really fix the species was the sterilization or castration of all members of the non-Aryan races. What? Jesus. What in the hell is... Which, in contrast to Hitler... It doesn't... Actually, it seems a lot worse... Well, no, it seems yeah, equally yeah. as bad. You can live without your balls. That's it's true. tough. It's tough, but, but you're alive. Yeah. Uh, but just... before we let Lons off the hook, uh, he actually had a bunch of ideas for how to deal with these races. He thought they could be enslaved, used as beasts of burden, shipped off in a mass deportation to Madagascar. That's a really tiny island, though. I don't know. It's pretty big. You can see it on the on the map of Africa. It, it's, it's really large. Nevertheless... <laughs> I don't think that makes it better. I guess that DreamWorks movie really screwed up yeah, how you're, big you're I thought you, Madagascar was. Do they, like, cross it in a day? Yeah. No, you, can't, you don't think you can do that, because it can be seen from space. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, now, here's the one Hitler liked. Uh, if you don't want to ship them to Madagascar, you can burn them as a sacrifice to the Aryan god. Uh-oh. Yeah. Um, so, although Liebenfels would have settled for a castration, he also said, or you can... Now you feeling about human sacrifice over there now, literal. But this isn't proper. This is not proper. It's not proper. I agree. At all. It's not a proper human sacrifice in the first place. Totally and it's improper. also like... It's racist. Why do they gotta be so goddamn racist? <laughs> right. Damn it. That's Damn. not what sacrifice Let's curse at them again in various languages. Keep your racial... Skatagafali. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm gonna count at them in Japanese. Ichi ni san. She. Just keep no, your, your racial bullshit Go. out Ruku. of yeah. Ichi, hachi, kuju. <laughs> I counted to ten at them in Japanese. That's That'll amazing. show them for their racism. Sacrifice isn't about prejudice. Because they were convinced the Japanese would rise up and they'd have to battle each other. So they would be terrified of a white American counting at them in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> That's good I logic. I am brain dead at this point in the episode. <laughs> I, I don't know I'm what's happening. You have no idea what's going on. Nope. We've broken you. I'm gone. Right. <laughs> Do you want to count in a different language, James? See if we can drive her insane? Sure. Uh, en, de. I, no, that's too close I don't to understand home. that. <laughs> I know what that is. It's French. Ena, dio, tria, desera, vende. I don't know what that is. Ooh, Greek. Greek. Yeah, you couldn't Greek hear the Greek? Me. I don't speak Greek. I could feel the Greek. Because I, yeah. I had a pita over the weekend. Lance's <laughs> next big move was to yes. found an occult order around these ideas. The Order of the New Templars, or ONT. Lance had a strong interest. Not- Aunt. Oh, oh, see, I heard N-O-T. 
<laughs> not. Lons had a strong. Everybody showed up and there was nobody there. So There's just Lons right sitting now. on the doorstep going, <laughs> not. Not. Lons had a strong interest in the medieval Knights Templar, who had been one of the strongest fighting forces in the Crusades. Are so arguably one of the most racist. Uh, and fell into disrepute after the Crusades finally failed and were persecuted for supposedly satanic practices. All true. He be- and I think we're going to do an episode about the Templars next year, actually. Sweet. He believed that they were the same as the mythological Grail Knights of Arthur's court. Here we go again. More LARPing. The Grail was actually the Aryans' lost psychic powers. Oh. What? The Holy Grail is not a cup... It is the psychic powers of the Aryan races. Either way, either way, you can't find them. And the quest <laughs> for the Grail was the knight's strict breeding regimen, which was destined to create new psychic Aryans, if only they hadn't been burned as Satanists. Admission <laughs> depended in part, uh, admission to the ONT, on the purity of a member's blood. Their orders included giving preference to each other in professional situations... So, like, helping each other get a job and a loan and stuff. That's so casual compared to the rest of this. Like, I don't... And marrying suitably Aryan partners. Of course. Who you have to prevent from sexing pygmies because they just want to so bad. Of course. The ONT spanned both sides of World War I, founded by Lons in the first decade of the 20th century and championed by Detlef Schmood <laughs> after the war. I love that. How am I doing? How is that? Can you say his name again? Schmood. De- Detlef Schmood. I want that as a ringtone. And I want that to be <laughs> yes. I was, love that name. He loved, he was all he was the reason this survived the first world war, all this you know, crazy ideology. But his name. There were never more than three hundred members in the ONT, so we can relax a little about this. Alright. Yeah, there's it didn't uh, happen, it's fine. I teach more students I mean, in a year than we're members of the <laughs> ONT, and we have more listeners. Uh, by far than there are there were members of the ONT. So our influence is, is bigger than the ONT. Um, Take that, ONT. Ha! They're rolling in their graves. So its influence was more esoteric than the Ostara magazine, but it was a place where Lons could practice his occult views on race. The Ostara, by contrast, and this will make us feel worse, had a distribution over a, of over 100,000 in 1907. Ew. Yeah, we're not quite there on occult confessions <laughs> at 100,000. We got some ground to cover. Uh, but the Ostara, people were reading. A young, poor Hitler began looking for a new way and found himself on course to found the Third Reich, in part with a copy of the Ostara in his hand. The question of whether occultism leads to Nazism is worth asking. So now we've reached the opinion portion of today's if episode. If occultism no. leads to no, Nazism? Definitely. That's if, what we're going to We're going to probe this question. I definitely feel like Nazism was found its roots in, in the occult after this episode. But yes. I don't think all occultism leads to Nazism. No, no definitely I not. tend to agree. Occultism tends to gather in the name of secretive practices, and they tend to privilege some sort of hierarchy of members. So, okay, so far we're feeling a little Himmlery, making us feel uneasy. For Lons and his <laughs> followers, <laughs> this suggested that the aristocracy was literally better and more magical than the rest of us, and then that there was a racial hierarchy correlating to the occult hierarchy. So all this is feeling pretty fascist. Not feeling great for occultism. We have devoted an entire podcast to this. Let's see if we can get out of this hole. (laughs) So, occultism seems to have fascistic tendencies, yeah? I just am so brain dead right now, Rob. (laughs) As a counterpoint to this, we can look at the career of Friedrich Bernhard Marby. Now, this guy's going to save us, occultists, from Hitler. Save me, Marby. Is he going to fix me? (laughs) He developed his own rune theories after reading Guido von List's work. So we could look at Guido von List as the inspiration for the swastika Nazism... Or we can look at him as the inspiration for Friedrich Bernhard Marby. So he began practicing astrology, our buddy Marby. He developed the practice of rune gymnastics, which is a bit like (laughs) yoga, but with more magic. More magic. I would like to know more about this, Rob. By assuming postures inspired by the runes, humans could become better receptors of the cosmic waves which naturally channel into our bodies. I love this. He was denounced as an anti-Nazi occultist, perhaps by Himmler's magus Villiga to Weistor himself, and he was placed in a concentration camp at Veltsheim from 1936 until he was freed by the Allies in April 1945. Nine years in a concentration camp. Holy for crap. being an occultist. No, but for being an anti-Nazi occultist. Ah, so because there are Nazi we can occultists. have those. But yes. he doing cool yes. rune yoga. The yeah. Nazi occultist claimed that this guy was an anti-Nazi occultist. Right. 
and they should be locked up. So here's the point I want to get to with Marby. Marby reminds us that occultism is largely value neutral. Last year, uh, in my personal life, uh, in my professional life, there you go. I presented at a conference with, let's call him a less experienced scholar, who argued that occultism is really only practiced by the elite. I think that if that were, to, you guys already I was about are to say, on board. Are we the elite? No. <laughs> right? uh, well, he's not, he wasn't an anthropologist, so he doesn't have my experience with actual occultists. Oh, okay. He also arguably is not a very good historian of the occult. Uh, the argument that occultism leads to something like Nazism, the oppression of inferiors by a so-called master race, makes sense if you buy the argument that the occult, is, occult it belongs to an elite. But what do we do with Marby and his Nazi unapproved rune gymnastics? Occultism really belongs to the popular imagination, as much as it does to secret hidden cabals. And a secret hidden group can be elite or it can be part of a working class resistance, like many of the secret societies in China, for example, mm-hmm. who periodically rose up to oppose imperial power and literally existed as a check on imperial power. There are ivory tower occultists, but there are also backwoods occultists. John Dee and his ivory tower practiced at the elbow of Queen Elizabeth. He's a stark contrast to my favorite American psychic mediums at the height of the spiritualist craze in America in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, who were often born poor. Going back to many, if you listen to our Maggie Fox episode or about Cora Richmond or Victoria Woodhall, and were supported largely by middle and working class patrons, not wealthy patrons, with rare exceptions. The danger of occultism is that it can be twisted to evil ends, like Nazism, for the very fact that occultism is inherently value neutral and promises secret powers untethered to explicit moral codes. Yeah, like Harry Potter. Okay. Like Harry Potter, except that's made up. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> it's the, the idea that, you know, magic can exist, but I mean, there's like, there's good occultists and bad occultists. There's neutral occultists, people that just look at their astrology signs. They don't really think about like, it's you true. Know, good or bad. I, it, it's, just, it's just a medium. It's like science. Science can be used to do horrible things, but it can be used for the betterment of mankind or the betterment of my day today. It by itself is a neutral thing. Yeah. Well, there's no such thing as black and white. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's not good or evil. It's, there's always a mixture of both. It's on the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) And usually we nestle occult practices within larger codes or systems of thought philosophies like Wicca or Satanism or spiritualism or what have you. So it doesn't just hang out on its own. Right. It, it has, what, specific kind of uh, connotations that go along with it? Yeah, there's codes on the culture of thought. It was born in. Yeah. Ways of processing the meaning of it, because it doesn't have a meaning except that we give it one. Oh. Mm-hmm. And especially occultism, where, like, the meaning is kind of something that you is not illicit. Well, it's, that... <laughs> it's mysterious. We have no idea yeah. what's happening. So as humans, we struggle to make meaning of it, and we can make that meaning in a Nazi register, or we can make that meaning in a spiritualist register mm. or in a Buddhist register. Yeah, I say it deviates just depending culturally. Yeah. Where you go, man. So the relationship between occultism and evil, as Savannah suggests, our new uh, sister of the 84th degree, <laughs> Hello, sister. Uh, is centuries old and continues to resurface in conspiracy theories, popular political movements, and as we'll find out in our next episode, uh, part one of two, to conclude our Black Magic series, uh, Satanism and the Left Hand Path. All right, Brianna, bring us home. Oh, I don't even remember. What oh, is it? Man. Um, I, hereby I hereby adjourn this meeting. Of the secret order. Of the order secret or order of alchemical Is that a part actors. of it? Alchemical actors until such a time that we should do it again. As we get together and do it again or no it's James, such a time to... comes that we should get together and do it again i think it's a captain of the table responsibility I, I hereby adjourn this meeting of the secret order of alchemical actors until we get together and do it again close enough i'm such a failure <laughs> Uh-oh. you did a fine job your rune diagram will be something people treasure on the instagram and beyond you can find us on instagram facebook and twitter Hashtag podcast occult or something. No. Uh, at pod, I don't know at anything about Twitter. At podcast occult. At podcast. Clearly, I'm Hashtag not running the Twitter. You can't 
<laughs> you can, don't hashtag us. Hashtag occult confessions. Can you do that? It's, yeah. Okay. You could hashtag it, but like the actual account is. Yes, you want to. Yes, at occult. I totally Instagram. zoned out. So uh, we are going to. <laughs> you can. <laughs> You can visit us at www.occultconfessions.com where you can find all of the resources we've used to assemble this episode and our other episodes. And as always, we encourage you to like and subscribe. Uh, Write a review for us. We've been hearing some wonderful reviews, very encouraging, keeping us going. And just a buck a month on Patreon uh, is enough to let us know you care. Give us all the stars. And all them stars also good for us. Yeah, we used to have three sons. Now we only have one. Right. Thanks, listeners. It's like, what? that's not your fault. No, you guys didn't get rid of those other sons. <laughs> I thought you meant sons, like children. <laughs> no, no, we still have all of our children. Do we have children? We I have, have one child. child. We have one child. We have one child. We all, to- all one together, child. we share yes. one child. Your child. <clears throat> our voices today, we had John Cook. We had uh, Dan Rosendale joining us for the first time. Nick Ross also joining us for the first time and providing backup on Nazi data. Yeah. D- Nazi data backup. We had Hunter Sheeler and Shannon Landers, our Instaquisitor, uh, shouting out in the conflict between Wotanists and Christists, Kristen Hammers. Ooh. Joining us in discussion, we have our newly christened sister of the 84th degree, Savannah Barrett. Hello, that's me. Goodbye, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> so everyone, we always have trouble saying goodbye, don't we? Yeah, I, yeah it's, so, it's so hard to say goodbye. Never sometimes. can say goodbye. Uh, Brianna Litterall, our metallurgical prophet. Yep. Oh, bye. And James Caplangis, captain of the table. Farewell. Me, my name is Rob Thompson. I am your supreme hierophant and host here on Occult Confessions. We will see you, listen to you, hear you, speak to you next time, where we begin our two-part discussion of Satanism.